Welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Clemens Hoffman. Each week we will discuss tools, tips, and ways to radiate your best life ever, interviewing practitioners, authors, and luminaries to help you on your path. Wellness, joy, peace, abundance. What do you want to radiate? Hi, and welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. Today we radiate connection with Sammy Aaron, who has a new foundation called um, The Resilient Activist. And The Resilient Activist teaches us all how to take better care of the earth and how to be better stewards of it. It's uh, educational in its focus, and I think it's going to be doing a lot of really great things. So welcome, Sammy. Thank you for joining me. Well, thanks, Christy. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here, too. So the Resilient Activist um, is just launched. It's just brand new, isn't it? Right. We incorporated last March, so March of 2018, and got our 501c3 in July. And we're just formalizing. We've just finished our first set of programs. Mm -hmm. and um, So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, you've done some programming done at Central Exchange, which is a Kansas City-based women's empowerment and networking organization. Pretty, It's a pretty big deal, Central Exchange. Yeah, I was delighted to be there. One of our core team members um, happens to work there. Nice. And so we were able to come up with some programming. It was a three-session series mm-hmm. that was geared towards business for good. And so the first session had to do with what's happening globally with social entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. people understanding that business has a tremendous impact on the health of the planet, on social justice issues, um, that it's not all about profit. Right. It's more about collaboration. It's more about (coughs) how many people can win in a business environment. So there's no winners and losers. There's only winners. And so the first session was about what was happening globally and different Mm -hmm. business structures and models um, that are coming out, some legal entities as well as um, organizations and associations. And the second Mm -hmm. session uh, was more local in the Kansas City area. So it was... Um, talking about our five essentials for a resilient world and going through each of those with examples of what a business can do to implement uh, benefit for each one of those and what local resources, companies, organizations um, that are available to help them implement some of those changes. Mm -hmm. And then the third session was inspiration and action. And so that was where... Um, one of our core team members, our board members, Beth Sarver, led that was a way to help people take one project having to do with one of the five essentials right. and implement that with a full plan. By the time they left that third session, wow. they knew who their partners were going to be, um, what a timeline was, what their tasks list was, and they even had a plan for how they would be held accountable for what they wanted to do. So that was the first, that was our business session at Central Exchange. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds really exciting. I'm sure it was very well received. It was. We had some really good feedback, and we want to um, gather some businesses that will help us develop that into ongoing programming geared towards specific industries. Right, right. Because it could really be easily customized. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's kind of over the next few months. We'll be gathering some teams of people to help us develop those programs that we can introduce in different industries, whether they're here locally or... um, I've had a couple people offer to videotape and get us more uh, exposure on the internet and that kind of thing. So. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Now, you could have gone in so many directions. I mean, just as a, an individual who's passionate about the environment, who's passionate passionate about social justice and corporate justice and just being in a more equitable world, you could have just gone about your own business doing the things that you know are effective and feel like are effective and do your own networking. But no, you chose to start this whole new foundation 
And so um, why'd you go in that direction? I thought it was interesting. Yeah. So, well, the Resilient Activist is not a foundation. It's a okay. nonprofit, which is Thank a little you. bit different. But um, so the story really started about 16 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I had been a software developer my whole business career with my own company and dabbled in being a bit of an environmentalist on the side. And we did a lot of, um, as a family, social justice, volunteer work, different places and things like that. And um, my older son was a deep environmental activist, and he had gotten his undergraduate degree in environmental studies and sociology. Perfect. He was working on his master's in urban and regional planning at Berkeley, and he was also in a joint law program. Mm -hmm. And we would joke he was going to be the only attorney in the world whose parents would always have to support him (laughs) because he would be working for some nonprofit that didn't have money to pay him a living wage. Right. So the, the problem was that the more he learned, the deeper he understood the complexities of what was happening to the environment and the implications and the effect that that was having on social justice issues around the world, right. the more he began to feel that he personally wasn't going to make any difference and there was no way out. And we lost him to suicide in 2003. Yeah. So... The whole concept of Brazilian activism is the fact that we need activists. And most of the activists I know are a lot like my son. Soft, gentle souls who care passionately about something, who don't have the funds, the support, or even the knowledge that they need their own support systems to be resilient. That's a very good point. This is this is soul work. This is hard work. It's heartbreaking work. It feels like you're pushing a boulder up a mountain. You've got to have support around you. Exactly. And so after he died, um, I jumped into the day after his funeral, my first yoga class ever, and mm. um, really began to study yoga, meditation. I became a yoga meditation teacher, and I focused on... Um, people in grief and people who um, were in physical pain yes. and um, those were that was kind of my focus and as I went through my own grief process mm-hmm. and I found the benefits to those practices kind of this kernel started you know kind of developing in the back of my mind about wow I wonder I wonder what would have happened if my son had been in a position where he would have acknowledged and accepted these kinds of practices. Oh, right. Right? Okay, because, yeah. I mean, he was in right. San Francisco. It's not like there's no yoga out there, right? right. Or meditation. For or meditation, matter. yeah. But <clears throat> but it wasn't part of his mindset. It wasn't part of our teachings as a family. It right. wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything that we knew other than, well, you need to see a psychiatrist and you need to get on meds if you're that depressed. Mm-hmm. And, of course, those things are a whole different perspective on healing. They are. They can have great benefit, but without that spiritual support, without that, there's there's a whole other component that was missing for, for him. And, right. And that's what these were. And another huge part of this... So asking about why why nature, why the environment. Exactly. As I went through probably the first seven to ten years after he died, Mm -hmm. a huge part of my grieving process took place out in nature. Mm -hmm. And there were days where I was compelled to be out in nature. Right. I couldn't do anything else. I had right. to just get in the car and drive down the Flint Hills. Or I had to jump in the car and go somewhere um, to some park here where I could just be in nature. And the more that I did that, the more I began to really feel that connection, that there's, there's this sense when you're in nature that you can be whoever you are. Mm-hmm. There's no judgment. Right. There's only welcoming, and 
of course, there's scientific study after scientific study proving all that. Of course. Right? right but right. when you experience it for yourself, mm-hmm. when you, you can go to nature and scream and cry and kick a rock and, and really express all that, and it's, it's just there. It's just happy to be there. It just mm-hmm. continues to do what it does. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I feel I get the feeling that nature, and this might sound a little woo-woo, but the trees and the rocks and the flowers and all of it is there to absorb all of that grief and help with it. It's, it's just like so giving when you're out there. It really yeah. is. And, you know, from a scientific perspective, mm-hmm. every time you exhale, you're exhaling CO2, and that tree wants it. It yes. inhales. Whatever you give it, it takes it in, mm-hmm. and it sends us back the oxygen that we need. So there's right. this literal, right, literal connection that we have. Mm-hmm. And... A lot of people, there are a lot of people grieving about the planet right now. And they're grieving about destruction. They're grieving about extinction. They're grieving about flooding. I mean, just seeing the news right now today up in Nebraska and Iowa is just, it's a nightmare. And there's this visceral connection that we humans have to what's happening to the planet, to Mm -hmm. all of nature. Mm -hmm. And the most healing thing you can do is give back to it because it feels so good to give back. Mm-hmm. It feels so good to recognize what we receive from a healthy environment mm-hmm. and to find whatever ways we can to give that back. Right. So that's, that's the nature piece. It just, it was such a truth for me mm-hmm. and such a healing process for me to be in nature yeah. And allow it to give me whatever it was, whether it was just metaphors or fresh air or a sharp, you know, sense on my face with a temperature change mm-hmm. or even just the shadow of a cloud moving over the sun would catch my attention and kind of bring me back to like a reality, mm-hmm. like stepping out of my grief into this eternity and you know mm-hmm. it was very interesting I'm sure yeah and I wonder mm-hmm. if you feel more of a connection with your son when you're out in nature yeah a lot of times there was this sense of um, typically I would when I was compelled to be out in nature right it was because there was a particular thought or memory or idea or regret or something that was just... I couldn't get past it, you know, just ruminating on. Right. And to go out there, there's a concept I, I studied um, called the nature process. Mm-hmm. And the nature process is this idea that we're attracted to things that resonate with us. So it's kind of an energetic level thing, right? Like attracts right. like. And so when I would go out with a particular topic that I just couldn't get past, couldn't reconcile in my mind, I'd go out and I would just start meandering and look for something that just kind of resonated with me out in nature. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I would see that, I would, I would go be by it. I would, you know, sit down by it or lay down or climb on it or whatever and would just start kind of talking to myself about it. Oh. So things like, um, I don't know, one day having this thought about why everything changes. Why does everything change? You know, right. and like, how are you supposed to find your footing if everything changes? And I'm looking, and then there's two pieces of native grass, like some Indian grass, a little floppy, just kind of blowing in the wind Mm. and the top was just as light and airy and flowing and moving but it was really solid and stable in the earth Mm -hmm. right and and it probably had roots that were 10 12 15 feet deep exactly very great and it's like oh my gosh well I guess if the grass can go with the movement of the (laughs) wind but still feel really grounded Maybe I can find that metaphor in my life. Oh, I love that. So that was the whole, right. that's a whole nature process piece. And as soon as I understood that that was mm-hmm. available out there, yeah. there was always this like attracts like, and I would see some something in nature 
that had that message for me, oh, right? Oh, I love it. That would just answer whatever it was. It took a long time sometimes. It took sometimes. a lot of tears. And, but, right. uh, you know, it's, really, it's a really healing place to be. Yeah, that's wonderful. So. And now you've developed this nonprofit that helps others understand that connection and helps others understand how we can take better care of nature so it can take better care of us. Exactly. So mm-hmm. that that really leads into it. Took us almost a year to figure this part out. Right. I have a great team of about um, ten to twelve people who've been really active with us um, since the Resilient Activists started. Yeah. And having this message of wanting to support people who want to support, who are working to support the planet in some way. Right. How do we offer that? You know. What does it look like without replicating what someone else is doing? And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's our particular soul work, I guess, Mm -hmm. you know, to bring that forward? So we finally formulated just about two months ago what we call our five essentials for a resilient world. Wonderful. Yes, that's wonderful. Yeah. And so it's a... It's an interconnect. It's how everything's interconnected. It's the whole butterfly effect, really, mm-hmm. and and yet we're we're making it really simple with what we call our Enviro tips, which are very simple steps that have a big impact in each one of these five essentials. Okay. So the five essentials. Mm-hmm. The first one is reconnect to nature. Okay. Of course. Okay. Of right. course. You have to reconnect right. so that you get it. Mm-hmm. First of all, right. people protect what they understand and love, right. secondly. Yeah. And thirdly, all the benefits, the scientific benefits of um, reduced blood pressure, increased concentration levels, mm-hmm. um, a sense of happiness and well-being, and like study after study that shows the time spent in nature, like forest therapy and things like that, right. that have a physiological benefit to us. I mean, there are actually trees out there that put out in their fragrance antibiotic properties, like, you know, antibacterial back, you know, it's it's very Wonderful. interesting. So anyway, so reconnect to nature is right. the first. The next okay. is respect all life. Oh, yes. So whether it has to do with working within communities mm-hmm. around you, working with mm-hmm. communities globally, looking at the environmental impact and destruction, Mm. especially for indigenous communities. Um, In addition to that, working with and understanding, respecting all non-human life. Yes. So whether it's humane treatment of farm animals Mm -hmm. and people actually making that choice of the food that they eat, if they eat meat or they, they eat eggs, that that animal has been certified raised humanely. Yes. That is a choice that we can make. It is a choice we can make. Yeah. But the other is respect for all non-humans. So, for example, mm-hmm. a lot of people are really interested in what's happening with a monarch butterfly. Absolutely. And it's, the monarch butterfly is an indicator species, basically. Like so a canary in the coal it's mine? A, it is a canary, canary in the coal mine. And mm-hmm. as the monarch goes, so goes oh. all of our pollinators. Well, if we want to have that clean air and fresh water that we have to have for our healthy right. food, for our healthy lungs, we have to have those things. Yes. We have to have healthy pollinators. We have to have... Um, that entire cycle of life and food yes. chain right. that supports that. So things like not using chemicals in your in your yard, mm-hmm. um, even doing things like I, there's an EnviroTip article on our site that has to do with loving the tomato hornworm. Mm, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So when people grow tomatoes, they are taught that they are to take that tomato hornworm and kill it. Mm-hmm. And I've heard some really interesting ways that people have been taught to kill the tomato hornworm. Well, if you let that tomato... So it's a non-beneficial insect. Right. right? It's to be killed. But if you let that tomato hornworm mature, mm-hmm. it becomes the hummingbird moth. Yes. Also known as the sphinx moth, which is glorious and a beneficial pollinator. I see. So it actually pollinates your tomatoes. So well, that you can it, no, it doesn't pollinate tomatoes. It doesn't, okay. No, it poll- because tomatoes are buzz pollinators. 
So you hmm. need a, a big bee, like a bumblebee okay. or a carpenter bee, to buzz pollinate tomatoes. Okay. So honeybees don't pollinate tomatoes either. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. No, the hummingbird moth, moth has a tongue that's about 10 inches long. Wow. And it pollinates tubular plants. Okay. So, you know, tubular blossoms. Yes. Um, so we're taught to kill the infant stage of this beneficial pollinator uh. but protect the adult stage. So we humans have some relearning that we need to do. We do. Yeah. So just so you'll know, put a sacrificial tomato garden in. Throw some plants out somewhere else. Pick those babies off of there. Yes. Off of your good plants. Go let them eat these other. And they'll eat anything in the nightshade family. So potatoes okay, and good. eggplant and stuff. So anyway, um, so that's the second one. And that's on your website. Life. It is. There's oh, an Envira okay. tip article about the tomato hornworm. Good. Um, the third is to regreen the planet. Ah. So if you take a look at the footprint of your home. Right. The footprint of your office, mm-hmm. the footprint of your doctor's building, mm-hmm. and the hospital, the Target, and the Walmart. You look at those footprints, that all used to be deciduous forest, maybe. Yes. Maybe it was tall prairie grass land. prairie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that used to absorb CO2 from the air. It used right. to absorb water mm-hmm. when we would have these heavy rainfalls, and that water would stay there, be filtered settle down, seep into the groundwater. Yes. Well, now what we have is runoff. And right. all we have during our rainfall is water rushing along with all the chemicals on the streets and the rooftops down into the stormwater and straight out into our streamways where we yes. have flooding. Yes. So it's all connected. So this whole piece, anything we can do to re-green the planet, mm-hmm. putting especially native plants, shrubs, trees Mm -hmm. out on our properties getting rid of mowed grass as much as we can right which has no benefit for anyone but the human eye Mm -hmm. um this can make a huge difference so that's the third one Uh the fourth is to revamp our spending yes we can choose what we spend our money on and we can choose what companies we want to do business with right vote with the dollar vote with our dollar but you have to even understand what that means so for example there is a hair care product out there i'll say the name called redkin pretty popular Mm -hmm. pretty popular if you go to their website Mm -hmm. there is not one statement about the environmental impact of the products they use or where they're sourced. There's no statement about um, whether or not they uh, test their products on animals. And there's no statement at all about any philanthropic or giving back um, to society, to Mm -hmm. any groups. Nothing at all. Well, probably not about their packaging either. And nothing about their... Nothing. There is nothing about there are no statements. any of that. No okay. statements. If you go to a product like Aveda, yeah, which is all Aveda. organic... Um, now, it's interesting because Aveda, Aveda was purchased by Estee Lauder, so that's another whole different concept. Oh, but no. the company yeah. itself, when you look at their website or you look at the website of any company that has chosen to really take a stand, mm-hmm. it's all over their website. It is. This yeah. is where we get our raw materials from. This is um, our what we're doing to minimize our impact on the planet. Yes. This is uh, our, the en- our energy use, mm-hmm. no animal testing, right. that kind of thing. So we can make those choices. Mm-hmm. We can also choose, in addition, to not buy and not buy new. Mm-hmm. So anytime right. you cannot buy something <clears throat> brand new, great choice. Borrow it. Collect it from somewhere. Uh, Go to a library to buy it. I mean, there are even lending libraries in different places that loan out tools, right? So it's it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this whole concept of buying used um, rather than just reduce, reuse, and recycle. Right. There's 12 or 15 words now, you know, refuse. Yeah. Reduce, reuse, uh, repurpose, reimagine, re-gift. Right? It's, it's a very interesting concept. So revamp our spending. That's number four. Right. And then number five um, has to do with, oh, gosh, I'm just going to forget number five. That's okay. We've got plenty to work it's, with. Okay, wait a minute. Because it's coming up there. It's in the circle. 
it is, um, oh, it's going to come to me in a minute. It will. I should have brought my cards with me. <laughs> it will. <laughs> but so much to work with. I know um, I love to shop at Trader Joe's. They do have a pretty good selection of organic um, and their foods are delicious, uh, easy to prepare. They have so many great frozen items, but they're packaging. And they've just made a statement that they Good. are going to be eliminating their packaging. And it only happens because consumers ask that question. Yes. And consumers have been yes. really vocal about it. So yes. they, they have taken a stand. I don't know that it's actually happened yet. Yeah. But, yeah, it's very interesting. But at least they're responding to consumers. I know mm-hmm. I, I notified them about there was, a, I don't know, some product, some sort of candy or something that I thought, oh, that looked really good. But they were individually wrapped. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're, they've got these delicious mochi desserts that come in these kind of ice cube tray things that are not recyclable. Right. Right? Yeah. So um, yeah. they need to do a little bit better job, but it sounds like they're responding. Yeah, and so that's actually number five. Okay, good. <laughs> See? It's replenish our resources. Wonderful. And so having to do with packaging, right? having to do with what is recyclable and what isn't, yes. and the whole shift in what's happening with recycling anyway, Oh. now that we can't send it to China, right? and India has also now refused to take our recycling. So, because they are on a mission to be um, pretty much plastic-free within another five years. India is. Yeah, it's very interesting. That is huge. Yeah, so this is shifting. And so we need to really um, think about our packaging, whatever we're recycling, that's like the last step. So it used to be it trash was the last step, but now recycling is the last mm-hmm. step. So, like in Kansas City, there's a shop called uh, Scraps KC. Oh yes, I love nonprofit. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. And they'll take whatever um, you can't put in your recycling, but before you put it in your trash, mm-hmm. if it has some value to teachers, to businesses. Um, looks like it might work for a great art project. That's so good. things like old notebooks or. I mean, just anything that has some use still, mm-hmm. they'll take that so someone else can use it. And so that whole replenish our resources, yes. it's not just that, but it's also this component of giving back to the soil. Composting, food yes. waste, for example, yes. 23% of what's in the Johnson County landfill mm-hmm. is food waste. And a place where there are people who are food insecure, that exactly. is just astonishing. Yeah. So there's a lot of organizations coming up that are working for food insecurity. There's a, an organization called After the Harvest that is okay. gathering um, food from farmers that's a little past its prime that they can't sell. That's there's some good. other places taking food from restaurants. and mm-hmm. So it, it all goes together. And that whole concept of giving it back to the soil and back to clean water, um, it has to become how we live our lives. Yes, it does. Yeah. And that's what I love about the resilient activist, because we can be passionate about the environment, we can be outraged by the things we see, but when we know what we can do to help, then that's very empowering. It's very empowering, and that that's a huge part of what we hear from people is, I really care but I don't have any idea what to do. Exactly. It's overwhelming. I'm not going to make any difference, Mm -hmm. right? That whole mindset. Mm -hmm. And the reality is a whole bunch of people doing as many things as they're able is going to make a huge difference. Oh, absolutely. So if you can imagine, let's just take honey and the honeybee. Mm -hmm. One bee in its entire lifetime makes about a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. <laughs> okay, okay. And yet we have a whole lot of honey out and there. And we have a ton of honey uh, out there. Yeah. So it's this whole concept that each one of us stepping into whatever feels most appropriate and doable for us right now absolutely is vital for each one of us to take that step. Mm-hmm. I look at it like a yoga practice. How so? We're all where we are. We are where we are. We're exactly where we are, however flexible or non-flexible, whatever we're already doing. And you just decide to open the door to that yoga studio Mm -hmm. and take the first class that kind of resonates with you. 
Hmm, I think I'll do gentle. Hmm, I think I'll start with beginners. Hmm, I think I like yoga abs. You know, like I don't care what level you take, but step in the door and take a look at these five essentials. Decide right. what. So, for example, at the Central Exchange program, the third class, just hearing what different things people were going to do in their one project. Yes. So one woman said, I am going to make a list of everything that goes in my trash for a week and see what I can do. That is eye-opening. Yeah. Someone else said, well, I've been thinking about composting, and so I'm going to check that out. I'm going to compost. Sure. And it's like everyone has a, they already have something that kind of calls to them. Yeah, yeah, they they do. do. Right, yeah, right. So to find that, acknowledge it, Mm -hmm. and go ahead and just step into it. I promise there's an organization out there that has information, resources, websites, books, YouTube videos for everything, right? Exactly. And the more that we make that shift, that cultural shift, Mm -hmm. um, the better off we're all going to be. Right. Hi, this is Christy. I just want to say that we here at Radiate Wellness hope you're enjoying this podcast. It's free to you, and we hope that you find it informative and inspirational. Heck, even fun. We have just three small asks of you to help us radiate growth. First, please hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on. That way, you'll receive a notification every time that we have a new podcast episode out. Next, please give us a thumbs up a like, or a five-star review. If you're feeling inspired, a positive review wouldn't hurt. These two small things will help others find us when they're searching for great podcasts. Finally, please tell your friends about the Radiate Wellness Podcast. Better yet, show them how to find us and how to subscribe. If everyone did that, we would double our audience. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, in everything being all connected, because that's what we're talking about here, yeah. is that, you know, the resilient activist is a place where we can go and find find a way to connect with these other organizations, too. Exactly. And, you know, the, the piece about being connected, <clears throat> I think that's a huge part of the resiliency mm-hmm. part. Yes. You're not in it alone. Exactly. And... As you make a connection about one thing, it's going to lead to something else. It is. So if right. you decide that you want to benefit monarch butterflies, for example, okay. you may come and you put in a nice, let's say you put in a rain garden because mm-hmm. you have a wet spot in your yard. Yeah. Or you divert your downspouts into a low area in your yard and you put in a rain garden and you walk out there one morning and not only is there a monarch butterfly, but there may be an American bullfrog sitting down in that. And it's right. like, wow, you know, oh, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. So, there's, so, so that may be... Your next thing is like, oh my gosh, what do amphibians need? Is there is there a way I could build a little shelter, some habitat yeah. for this guy? And and it's like you just are on this path, and now oh that catches your attention. Let's go that way, and let's go that way. Right. And so the connection of community, yes, the connection of knowing you're not alone, yeah, and the connection of each step that you make is going to connect to the next step because now you've got your antennas up. Right, mm-hmm. you have shifted. You've kind of opened your peripheral vision yes. to be able to understand and see what's next. Because it feels really good. It does feel really good. Yeah. Every time you make that step, mm-hmm. there's a little uplift, mm-hmm. and it's contagious. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. yeah. I do want to mention there's a piece that you have, um, a little card that you can leave with restaurants. Tell me. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so that was, um, so the way that the, the actual, the resilient activist actually, uh, the seed actually began to sprout. Mm-hmm. I was at coffee with um, someone I had met, and she has a, a daytimer planner that I wanted to um, 
I wanted to use because I had all these ideas in my head about some resilient activist thing. You know, I didn't know yes. what it was going to be. So we're sitting in a, in a coffee shop and looking. She's showing me her day timer, and um, and I'm and I said, well, here's what I want to use it for. And I and I just looked around. I said, for example, let's talk about plastic straws. And she said. I get so much flack for my nieces and my whole family because I don't, I ask them not to bring me a straw. And it's like such a struggle. Like, I just feel like I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm the only one out there who cares about not having straws. And we connected on this straw thing. Right. And it was the look in her eye when I said, well, that's part of what we want to do is support people. Like yes. you who care, mm -hmm. but you don't have the right words. You don't know scientifically why that's a bad thing. You don't even know the right words to express it to a restaurant owner, right? right? It's like, and so that that was kind of our catalyst, that conversation. So what we have are these cards. We call it our first Enviro tip card. Nice. That is no straws, no styrofoam. Yes. And it folds into a little tent that with a picture of you know straw and styrofoam with a red circle and a slash and um you can take that into a restaurant and you just show it to the wait staff as you're being seated and ask not to have a straw in your water yes but you leave it on the table and you ask us i'm just going to leave this here so when you order from the bar Mm -hmm. I promise you that bartender is going to put some plastic straw or stick or something Absolutely. because that's how their hands go. Like right. they just automatically do it. So it's kind of a way to open that conversation. Right. And if you open this card up at the top, first there's a link to uh, our big EnviroTip article about Good. straws and no straws and no styrofoam. But there's also some bullet points about you can just point to this and say, this is why I care about this. So it's got a little bit of the science as to why it's important. Good. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom is some information for restaurant owners and what different restaurants are doing. Good. And the other side is what consumers can do to begin to eliminate straws and styrofoam. And you just ask from your heart and say, do you think the manager or the owner would be interested in knowing that one of their customers cares about this? And if so, could I leave this card with you just to let them know that this is really something that I hope that they'll, um, you know, take to heart. Right, right. So, some, some restaurant owners are starting to get that and, Eliminating the styrofoam. Um, I haven't seen anybody in Kansas City particularly eliminate plastic straws, but I've heard of others around the country who are using paper straws. There's actually quite a few in Kansas City. Are there? Yeah. I'm happy and, to hear mm -hmm. that. And there's a number of them now that are, especially in the mom and pop restaurants, the locally Good. owned restaurants, where the wait staff might carry um, straws in their pockets, mm -hmm. but they don't even offer them. People right. have to ask. So, and a lot of people are buying their own, um, you know, metal right. or, or um, silicone straws. Right. Um, some people, like, I just don't use a straw. And I, the only exactly. time I ran into a problem is with a smoothie. So, I oh. just really probably need to get my own. But, um, right. yeah, it's just an interesting, you know, we didn't use straws when I was a kid. Right. You know, unless we went to the soda shop, and that was the only time. So, and exactly. they were paper straws back and they were paper then. paper straws. But, yeah, it was just these habits that we humans think are really important. Like, some people say, well, I don't know how clean the glass is. Well, putting a straw in it isn't going to make that glass any cleaner. Right. Right? It's as clean as it is. And if you're okay drinking the insides of it, you know, exactly. it's just this kind of, well, that doesn't even make any sense. So right. we, but we get these mindsets about what, what we have to do. We have to have a really neat, clean yard, for example. Mm -hmm. We have to clean our leaves up every year, mm -hmm. right? It has to be gone or they're going to blow in the neighbor's yard. And if they do, the neighbor's upset. Well, the deal is there are overwintering pollinators in those leaves. So, for example, the Luna moth. Oh, yes. 
Have you seen the Luna Bob? Mm-hmm. They're lovely. They're gorgeous. They're about four inches tall, mm-hmm. kind of a soft green, and they really look like little fairies when they, they fly. Do. Yeah, mm-hmm. that really long tail. Well, they overwinter in those leaves. So the adult, the female will lay her eggs on leaves and trees, mm-hmm. and then as the leaves drop, Mm-hmm. Those eggs mature over the summer, I mean over the winter, and they don't come out, they don't actually emerge from their cocoons until it warms up, like this time of the year. Right. So if you shred those leaves, oh. if you even blow them, that that it's like going through a tornado for them of course. if you use blowers. And if you rake them up, put them in bags, and either burn them or send them to the landfill or even send them for composting, mm-hmm. you're killing an entire season's worth of Luna moss. Right. This is a huge part of why our pollinator populations are down. Oh. Is because we don't leave our leaves. And right. for a lot of other reasons. That, that benefits soil quality. It provides habitat for all kinds of crit- critters, overwintering habitat, right. to have that leaf cover on the ground. So there's things that humans have been taught globally right. that a clean, empty, grass-mowed lawn mm-hmm. is the right way to live. Mm. This is an incorrect assumption wow. for a healthy planet. Wow. Yeah, I think it's just awareness, as you said. Yeah. And with the straws and the styrofoam packaging, I think it just doesn't occur to a lot of people. Not that they've been taught any certain way, but it's like they're not aware. Well, and it's a lot cheaper. So Uh, when you're in the restaurant business, um, it's really hard to make that choice. Are you going to spend .005 cents on styrofoam packaging, or are you going to spend maybe 15 cents Right. on paper or, mm-hmm. you know, something else that it's going to cost more money. But right. that needs to adjust. There's a true cost of doing business. There the is. The true cost includes the impact to the planet. Mm-hmm. That's the true cost. So whether it's absorbed by the restaurant owner or mm-hmm. it's absorbed by the consumer or it's absorbed by the, all of us mm-hmm. who have to breathe the air... That comes right. from all the, you know, the plastic and um, anyway, it's it's a um, it's all very com- it's all very connected. It is very connected. <laughs> well, and yeah. we don't realize that what we might throw out the window in terms of a gum wrap or something like that is going to blow, get in a waterway, eventually end up in the ocean. All right. waterways are connected. That's exactly right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was just reading an article this morning about how. Um, there was a, a whale that was washed up, and they opened the stomach, and there were 88 pounds of plastic mm-hmm. in the whale's stomach. Yeah, because they the way that they feed is water just rushes through. Right. And so whatever's in that water mm-hmm. just goes right into their mm-hmm. digestive system. So, yeah, there there is uh, plastic and plastic particles mm-hmm. in Every creature in the ocean, as far as they've been able to test, because a lot of the plastic will break down into little tiny balls about Mm -hmm. the size of size of like a sesame seed. Yeah, and it just floats on the water. It floats with the tides, and um, yeah, it's a huge impact that we humans have made. A lot of people say, "Oh, none of this is human induced." Well, Well, you know, we can choose not to use words like climate change and global warming. We don't need those words. Mm -hmm. But if we take a look at the human impact, it's really easy to Mm -hmm. see the impact of just how much deforestation we personally are responsible for based on where we live. Yes. And where we do business and where we go to school and where we go to the hospitals. We personally... It's not just tropical deforestation. No, it's not. It's not rainforest, uh, not only rainforest. So humans have made a humongous impact. Um, This is being called the the era, the Anthropocene era. Anthropocene? Uh Uh-huh, the era of the human. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because humans have deforested like 40% of the planet. So we are powerful beyond measure. We are powerful beyond measure to destroy, Mm. and we're powerful beyond measure to rebuild. I love it. So one of the things that um, 
I don't think I had even mentioned to you, I'm also um, an extension master naturalist. What is that? It's similar to the Master Gardeners program. Oh, sure. So the one I'm with is through K-State Extension. Mm -hmm. And a similar training program at Citizen Science. Mm -hmm. But we focus on ecosystems. Yes. And environments rather than just plants. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the things that I have spent about the last little over two years working on mm -hmm. is a restored toxic waste Superfund site in Old Olathe. So right off of Santa Fe and, and, Hunter, and Ridgeview, right, right in that neighborhood, little tiny houses all around mm -hmm. there, there was a company called Chemical Commodities that was there for from the 1950s to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And they were a sourcing company for manufacturers who had toxic waste. They would send it to this company who was supposed to know what to do with it. Right. right? This was before the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. But they were an approved source. And instead of doing what they were supposed to do with this chemical sludge, they dug a great big hole in the ground. Oh, no. Had like an old truck in there with kind of like a milk truck kind of thing. And they would just dump it in. And after 30 years, gosh, it never filled up. So there was, it was just seeping out oh, into the neighborhood. No. And um, it took until, so the EPA started in 1970. It took until it was in the late 80s before there was enough fires that happened there that the fire departments called the EPA and said, we think these people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So the EPA got involved, shut them down, and took about 20 years to restore that site. And wow. they literally had to, well, they bought out a number of houses that were right on the same block. Um, Boeing Company came in. They had purchased a small company that had contributed like less than 1% of the toxic waste to the site, but Boeing took full ownership of managing the Superfund site. Wow. I choke up every time I think wow. about it. Anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so they came in, and they had to take out eight feet of soil on a, more than an acre. Oh and, I mean, it was, it was quite devastated. And um, there's air quality monitoring equipment in 40 houses oh. around the site. So it was restored, and then um, some people got together and said, well, what if we make this a pollinator prairie? Really? Mm -hmm. So they got Chip Taylor from Monarch Watch K and from KU um, to come in and help them design the beds. So this is now a public site. It's a public gardens in the neighborhood oh my that the Extension Master Naturalists manage. And we have some educational programs that go on out there. Mm -hmm. And it's all related to benefiting pollinators and showing people how they can... Um, how these gardens might look in their own yards. Love yes, it. different from knockout roses, Stella Delora day lilies, Japanese barberry, and pompous grass. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look like that. No. Right? But it all has benefit for, for all of our pollinators and our birds wow. and our wildlife. So, so we have the power mm -hmm. to come back and restore. Will it look like a true prairie? No. No. Is it going to look anything like a remnant prairie? not for hundreds and hundreds of years, okay? Right. It can take hundreds of years to actually develop the soil quality and the diversity of plant life mm -hmm. and animal life. But at least we can make a stab at, at starting and getting that going. Yes. So wonderful. The, I, yeah. I love it. That's a great uh, project and great story to end it with. It is. And it's public. It's open to the public. Anybody can go anytime. What's it called again? It's called the Pollinator Prairie, and it's at 320 South Blake in Olathe. Fantastic. Okay. And Olathe, of course, being a suburb of Kansas City. Right. Wonderful. So um, before we sign off, any tidbit or something that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah. I would like everyone listening to take a deep breath and look around and pick something that they see that's really important to them and go pick it up 
and try and figure out where it came from. Literally. What were the raw materials? What was the cost to energy and water and fuel for manufacturing it, packaging it, shipping it? What will it what will be the cost when they go to get rid of it? And just think about one thing. Wow. One thing today. I I thank you for that. And I think if everybody did that and just looked at whatever it is that they really like, mm-hmm. realize all the people who touched it, mm-hmm. where the materials might have been grown, farmed, mined, yeah. ex- whatever, how it got there to you being able to purchase, it's astounding. Yeah. So we realize that we truly are all connected. Mm-hmm. I yeah. love that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we'll put um, your website, resilientactivist.org. The resilientactivist.org. Terrific. We'll put that in the show notes. And, um, you know, if anybody has any questions, they can go to your website. Absolutely. We'd love to hear from people. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sammy. I appreciate your time to come out and talk to me. Christy, thanks for having me. It's been fun. It has been fun. Good. Thank you. Radiate Wellness is a community of holistic and alternative healers and consultants based in the Kansas City area dedicated to helping you create spiritual, energetic, and physical well-being. To learn more about our practitioners, services, classes, and events, or to schedule an appointment, visit us at radiatewellnesscommunity.com.